Keep up your courage. I have faith that it will happen exactly as I have been told. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're in the middle of a sermon series, on toward the end now, um, having conversations about where and how our faith meets us in our everyday life, everyday life. So having practical conversations about what it means to have courage in the middle of moments of fear, what it means to make mistakes and still keep going, what it means to seek opportunities for growth. These are really important conversations that we have because we know that while big, really important things happen to us in our lives, there's also just stuff that we deal with each and every day that God wants to speak a word of presence into. And so we want to be the kind of people here at Church of the Messiah who really look for those moments and who recognize them and who say thank you to God for them while they're happening, not just after the fact. So today we're having conversations about borrowing courage in the middle of life's storms. Borrowing courage in the middle of life's storms. When the storms of life come, we might say to ourselves, I will borrow courage from God. I will borrow courage from God. Let's pray. God, we are here to experience your presence. We are here to hear from you. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to speak in this time of worship as we share in this meditation, this reflection on your word. Speak to us in the silence. Speak to us through the words. Help us to hear what you would have us to hear and propel us forward because of it. We ask all of this in Jesus' strong and mighty name. Amen. Storms happen. Storms happen. In August of 2005, a tropical storm made its way up from the Bahamas. It skirted the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, and it became a Category 1 hurricane over Florida. It picked up steam as it traveled further west over the Gulf, and by the time it made landfall in southern Louisiana, it was a Category 5 hurricane. There were 25-foot storm surges, winds up to 170 miles an hour, over 10 inches of rain in mere hours. The wind and the water of the hurricane caused all kinds of disaster, destroyed buildings, uprooted plant and marine life, obliterated infrastructure, bridges, roads, levees. It's hard to believe it has been 17 and a half years since Hurricane Katrina for those of us who were alive when that happened. And it is still the costliest disaster in US history. And it affected lives all over this country, from Florida to Texas, from the Bahamas to Ohio. But it is best known for its impact on New Orleans, Louisiana. I heard a story a while ago about New Orleans and about one of the hospitals there, Charity Hospital, during Katrina, Charity was a level one trauma center, part of the Medical Center of Louisiana. It was a teaching hospital. It had trained hundreds of thousands of doctors all throughout the state. It was also famous for providing quality medical care to the city's residents, regardless of their own ability to pay. And during the storm, lots and lots of people were evacuated from that hospital before because there was a mandatory evacuation order over the entire city. But there were some patients who were unable to be evacuated. And so they and their medical providers plans to weather the storm in place just like they had done many times in the past. You know, my husband is from a place which weathers hurricanes pretty frequently. And he says, you just kind of stay. You just kind of stay because they happen pretty regularly. The weather gets bad, and so you just kind of stay in place. But once Katrina hit New Orleans, as waters flooded through the hospital's basement and then flooded through the hospital's first and second floors, as its backup generators failed, not even the generators, but the backup generators, it was clear that this time was different, that they were in trouble. Pretty soon, temperatures inside the hospital reached 100 degrees, because there was no power, there was no medical equipment, because there was no water, there was no way to keep clean. 
And after a few days, they heard that they were going to be evacuated. That was really good news, but then the evacuation help didn't come, and it didn't come, and it didn't come for five days. For five days. So the medical staff and support staff decided instead of waiting, they were going to get themselves out. They were going to get themselves out. They couldn't reach FEMA. They couldn't reach the governor's office. They couldn't reach the National Guard, but they could reach the media. There's always somebody who's watching on Facebook. And so soon their story was on the national news. And so private helicopter companies airlifted the critically ill patients, but they could only do that after those patients had been carried down six flights of stairs by the staff and then put on a nearby parking garage roof. And some of those staff had to squeeze air into the lungs of those patients by hand while they were being evacuated. They evacuated that entire hospital, that entire hospital, not only by helicopter, but also by rowboat and by airboat and by 18 wheeler. That was my favorite, 18 wheeler, high enough to get over the floodwaters. It took 48 hours to evacuate the hospital, but of the 50 or so critical patients who had to remain in place, who weathered the storm there, only two died. That was extraordinary hardship. But those were ordinary, everyday people who exhibited ordinary, everyday courage. Storms happen in our everyday lives. Sometimes they are literal storms, like the storms of Katrina or the wonderful wet wind weather that we had on Thursday. Help us, Jesus. Y'all did not blow away. Congratulations. <laughs> Sometimes they're literal storms, but sometimes the storms of our lives are metaphorical, something that happens in our life that feels chaotic and unpredictable. Sometimes uh, uh, something that happens whose outcome feels uncertain. Sometimes they are big storms like a frightening diagnosis or a financial setback or a broken relationship that just keeps breaking or the experience of discrimination that just won't end. Sometimes the storms are smaller, like a deadline that you can't meet or a project that you failed on. You got a failing grade or a petty disagreement or bad traffic or maybe just an all-around bad day. Sometimes the storms are of our own making. They come from the choices we make. The choices that we make as an individual or as a family or even as a society. Sometimes the storms come from outside us. We hear them on the news. They affect us personally, or we're affected by an unjust policy that is outside of our control. What storms do you bring into this space today? The storms that you are aware of. Storms are happening to us now. But we also know that that's nothing new, is it? It's nothing new. They happened back then. Today's story from Scripture is a story from the Apostle Paul as he is journeying in a literal storm. Did anybody get seasick from that beautiful, I know, it's good, but it puts it in perspective, does it not? So Paul has been arrested. He loves Jesus so much, and he will not stop talking about it. And it's getting him in some trouble. And so he's been arrested, and he's being sent to Rome, where he is going to have to stand before the emperor and be put on trial. And to get to Rome, they have to get on a ship. And this is something that Paul does pretty regularly. He gets on a ship pretty often to talk about Jesus to everyone who will welcome him. And so he gets on a ship, not the first time. It's one of these everyday practices. You could think about it like how often you get in a car. That's probably how often Paul was on a boat. And so it's a windy day. But the crew is experienced, and so they decide what to do, and they think, let's, let's go for it. We'll, we'll try this out. They keep going, but by day two, it is very clear to everybody on board, they are in over their heads because the wind has picked up, and they're trying to stay close to the shoreline, but they can't stay close, and so now they either have to give in to the wind or be completely destroyed, and so they give in. And it's not long before they're very far from shore and they are adrift on the sea. And that is how they stay for days and days, lost at sea, without their necessary gear, the stuff that will keep them safe, without sun or stars for guidance, and with no hope of rescue or favorable weather anywhere in sight. 
And it's at this point that Paul gets up and makes a speech. And honestly, if you know Paul at all, you kind of want to roll your eyes because of what he's about to say. So check out what he says. You really should have listened to me, guys. You were like, sit down, Paul. You really should have listened to me. I told you it was too late in the season to attempt this journey. Do y'all have an I told you so friend? Yeah. In the Bible, it's Paul. Paul's the I told you so friend. But then he keeps going. He redeems himself a little bit because he says, from now on, things are looking up. This ship is doomed. But not one of us will drown. And I know this because last night an angel of my God came and stood by my side and said, don't give up, Paul. You're going to stand before Caesar yet, and everyone sailing with you is also going to make it. So, dear friends, take heart. Dear friends, he says to the people who are imprisoning him, dear friends, take heart, have courage. I believe that God will do exactly what he told me. When it feels like all hope is lost, and it would be easy and maybe even understandable for everyone on that ship to give into their fear and into their panic, Paul simply shares a message of hope. You can be courageous. And what does courage look like in this particular context? You can be courageous simply by not giving up. That's a really low bar. Isn't that nice? You can be courageous simply by not giving up and giving into your fear. You can be courageous. If you keep going in the middle of your fear, in a moment when you want to give in, you have courage. That's what Paul is telling folks. You can have courage. Friends, because storms happen every day, and they happen to us, to everyday ordinary people. And what I know to be true is that because we are everyday ordinary people, and because we don't feel like doctors in Hurricane Katrina or rescue workers during the earthquakes that are happening right now in Syria and in Turkey, or because we know that we are not world leaders, or because we're not heroes from Bible times, maybe what we have told ourselves about our own story is that we are not made for courage. I can't be courageous. What are you talking about? Only superheroes and superhumans can successfully meet life's storms with courageous hope. The rest of us are consigned to just weather the storm full of fear, stuck. It's one or the other, either or. It's fear or courage. That's the story that we tell. Nelson Mandela was South Africa's first black head of state and its first democratically elected leader. But before that, he spent 27 years in prison because he was an anti-apartheid activist, because he opposed the forced separation of people based on their race in his country. And he said something that I think about often as it relates to courage and fear. He said, one of the things that I learned is that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. That the brave person is not one who does not feel afraid, but he or she who conquers that fear, who moves through it. What he's saying is that courage and fear are not either or. Like either there's one or the other. In fact, they coexist. It's a both and. Anyone can feel fear, and because anyone can feel fear, anyone can have courage. When the storms of life come, whether they're big or small, whether they happen once in a while or they happen to us every day, all of us have the opportunity to respond to them with courage. It's a both and. And it's a choice. It's a choice that is available to us. We look at folks who saved lives during Katrina, who are saving lives right now in Syria and in Turkey. We look at folks who saved lives during the heart of the pandemic, who are on the boat with Paul, and we consider them superhuman, but really, friends, they were just humans. They were just humans showing up and doing what needed to be done, even when they were afraid. Those drivers of those 18-wheelers who drove folks out, the nurses who got folks down the stairs, people who show up with their rescue dogs, those are just people like you and me. All of us have the capacity for, the, for this. All of us have this choice. So when the storms of life come, whether they're little, literal or metaphorical, big or small, storms of our own making or storms that are forced upon us, 
what we know is that fear is usually not a choice, right? We experience that fear no matter what. But staying in the middle of that fear, that is a choice. The question is, will I stay still in the middle of my fear, or will I keep going in the middle of it? And one thing that becomes abundantly clear for us if we read this scripture carefully is that we don't go forward on our own courage, in our own power, by our own strength, from the middle of that fear. Not even Paul is that good, right? Like, he thinks he's pretty good. He thinks he knows a lot. But not even Paul can do that kind of work. His courage comes from God's presence, doesn't it? He knows the ship is going to be destroyed. But he also knows that the lives aboard will be saved. And he knows this because God's presence in the midst of the storm shows up to him in the middle of his fear and tells him so. His courage doesn't come from himself. It comes from God. It comes from God who stands in the middle of the storm with him, who doesn't leave him alone. Friends, that's good news. That's good news for you and for me. There stood beside me an angel of God, says Paul. It's good news that we know and that we love a God who does not leave us alone in the middle of our fear. A God who comes to us in the middle of our storms. There will be no loss of life among you, Paul says. It's good news that we know and we love a God who speaks hope to us and keeps on speaking to us in the middle of the storm. A God who speaks a word of hope because God sees where we cannot. Because God is committed to bringing about a future filled with hope. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor. It's good news, friends, for you and for me that we know and we love a God who makes promises and keeps them. It is good news. In the middle of our fear, when courage doesn't come from us, we can borrow it from God. And so that's how Paul is able to keep going. He's able to keep going because he trusts a God who will not leave him alone. Because he trusts a God who sees where he cannot. And because he trusts a God who promises things and then follows through. Now notice, it would be really easy to keep that kind of encouragement all to yourself. But what does Paul do? He tells other people, doesn't he? He doesn't keep that for himself. He shares it with everybody else on board. He lends it out. He tells everybody the good news. And then what happens in turn? If you keep reading in chapter 27, it's a really long chapter, so we didn't read it all. But if you keep reading, that good news in turn lends courage to everybody else on board the ship. It takes two weeks, 14 days they are in this storm. But with Paul's constant encouragement, they're able to keep going in the middle of their fear, and eventually they are shipwrecked, but they are all brought safely to land. And so we can get encouragement from Paul, too. This good news that he shared for those folks so long ago is still good news today. So as we close our time of worship, I'm going to invite you to just reflect for a moment. How is God speaking a word of courage to you today? There's a storm of life that you are facing right now. It might be big or small. It might be of your own making, or it might come from outside you. What storm is that? How are you feeling about it? You feeling scared? Or worried? Curious? Hopeful? How could you admit that feeling before God? You know, I know it's pretty cliche, the pastor coming and telling you, hey, you should talk to God about that. But if we're honest, sometimes it's the last thing we think of. Bring it to the Lord. Bring to God how you're feeling. Say it out loud. Write it down. How are you feeling? What is the storm? And then where can you recognize God at work? Where can you recognize God at work? What is your work in the middle of that storm and what is God's? God's work is to remind you that you are never alone. God's work is to keep God's promises. God's work is to continue to lend us courage when we can't find it inside ourselves. But we have work too. We have the work of keeping going in the middle of our fear. We have the work of remembering and continuing to trust. 
And we have the work of when we can't find it in ourselves, borrowing courage from God. You might not understand yourself to be a courageous person. You might not see yourself to be the kind of person who could hold it together during a big, big storm. But you are a person, friends, who, who God proclaims a word of hope to today. How is it God inviting you to take courage? At home? At work? At the grocery store? In traffic? At school? What's God inviting you to feel? Or say? What's God inviting you to think? And where is God inviting you to go? There's a world full of people out there who are experiencing God's storms so may we not only receive God's courage for ourselves, may we be the kind of people who lend it out, who not only borrow courage from God, but share it. May it be so in our lives, friends. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able. We are going to affirm our faith in the God who lends us courage. Pastor